Happy Easter, Valley View. He has brought us out of the darkness and into the light. Come on, let's sing this out together. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond. All creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord our God. He will not be loved when the earth gives way. together. Come on. Easter Sunday, and we are so thrilled to have each of you joining us online. My name's Brandon. I'm the worship pastor here at Valley View Christian Church. And we know it, Easter looks a little bit different this year. This is, we were talking as a team this week, and this is going to totally be one of those remember when moments in several, several years from now when we look back and remember about the time that you watched Easter services from your living room or wherever you may be. Um, We get to be here this morning celebrating the resurrected Jesus, our Savior who was sent by our Almighty God in heaven um, to fulfill a prophecy, but so much more than that too. Jesus came, he he put on flesh, he he walked around, he, for, for 30 plus years, ultimately he gave up his life for you. Ultimately he gave up his life willingly as a choice because he wanted to prove to you, to the world, how much he loves you. We're gonna move on with 
this amazing Easter Sunday that we've got planned, but we just want to give honor and glory to God because he has orchestrated, he has already gone before us, he has paved the way for us. God, we come to you in prayer thanking you for who you are, for without you we would be so lost. God, we thank you so much for Jesus, who you resurrected from the dead, who is alive with us right now in this place. God, we give you the honor, the glory, the praise, God, that you deserve in Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, your name is a light that the shadows. Value family, I'm Zach, and thanks for joining us this Easter season. I don't know if you've noticed, but this Easter service is a bit unconventional. In fact, this entire season of life we find ourselves in is pretty unforeseen and unexpected. At a time when we would normally find ourselves together, joining in praise for the miraculous and life-changing miracle of Christ's resurrection, we're instead isolated and distant. Now granted, this intentional separation we've created is not without good reason. The safety and health of our community, our friends and loved ones is no small matter. But distance does not define God's ability to transform and change lives, nor does it stop us from being able to engage with each other to enjoy life. And while it can be easy to fall prey to the angst of life at a time like this, it is also possible to find contentment and peace. In Philippians chapter four, verse 12 through 13, Paul writes, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Jesus who gives me strength. Easter is a time for family, for community, for joy. It's also the penultimate opportunity to celebrate the freedom we have through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And in a time like this, with the uncertainty of the future of our country and world, in the midst of sorrow, fear, doubt, and frustration, we can and should enjoy the peace of mind and heart that we have in our salvation. Christ shed his blood, allowed his body to be broken, and his spirit to be cut off from the living God. And all this so that we would gain the gift of a life that is eternal, unbound by flesh and bone, tethered to a God who is perfect and just, and loves us beyond our greatest imaginings. This is a gift that transcends the world we live in. It is stronger than any illness, greater than any financial hardship, more powerful than any storm, and more lasting than any empire. The gift of Jesus' sacrifice is the key to navigating this life. Not only can we celebrate that gift, but also the wonder of walking in a relationship with Jesus today. He is risen, and he's active in our lives from today until he returns. In this time of communion, I invite you to take a moment to throw off doubt and fear, any sadness, worry that lingers in your heart, and allow this time to be a moment to remember the gift that we have in Christ.
it's at this time that we want to extend to you an opportunity to contribute, to give back to the ministry here at Valley View Christian Church. We are so grateful for your contributions. It is because of what you have given to this ministry that we have been able to go from impacting and reaching a few hundred people through this online streaming to now impacting thousands of people, not even just people in our local community, but people throughout our country and even our world. And that is, be, and that is possible because of your contributions. And so we wanna encourage you to continue to support, to continue to give back to this ministry, to help us to fulfill this mission, to help families follow Jesus. You can do that by clicking on one of the links and you have an option. You can give a one-time gift or you can give a reoccurring gift, set up a reoccurring gift. I like to think of it as God offers us his grace and mercy on a daily basis. His grace is always reoccurring in our life. And out of appreciation for that, one of the ways that we can be grateful to him is to offer back a contribution to him with our finances. And so we invite you to do that just now. And again, we are so grateful for what it is that you contribute to this ministry at Valley View. Our theme this Easter is find your victory. We want you to find your victory today. If you're a sports fan like me, one thing that you haven't been finding much of is victories because we can't find any sports games that are allowed to happen right now, which is completely understandable, but it's hard to stomach still. And so since we can't find victories now, that got me to thinking about some of the greatest victories in the past here in Denver, Colorado, specifically with professional sports. The greatest Colorado Avalanche victory was probably in 1996. It's actually a toss up with that in 2001. In 1996, that was the first professional sports title that had ever taken place here that this city had ever received in 1996. In 2001, that was really just a special team with Ray Bork winning his first championship here in the, in the Denver area after 22 seasons of being in the NHL. The most uh, momentous victory in the Denver Bronco history was probably Super Bowl 32 in which they won their first Super Bowl. It was John Elway's fourth try and he finally won. This was the game in which the helicopter play took place. There was a third and sixth play. John Elway scrambles for the first down and when he's about two yards away he dives for the first down but the Green Bay Packers defensive um, lineman, they hit him in such a way that he spins in the air like a helicopter and just happens to land where he can get that first down. With the Colorado Rockies, their most impressive and memorable victory is probably the building of Coors Field, honestly. <laughs> the Colorado Rockies just don't have many great victories in their history. It's been said of the Colorado Rockies, unfortunately, that if mediocrity could be a person, then it would probably be the Colorado Rockies' best friend. They just haven't won much. But victory is still something that all of us want in our lives. And some of us have wanted a little bit more than others. And we want to find victory in all the areas of our lives, don't we? We want to have victory with our wealth, with our family, with our career, with our appearance, with our religious obedience. We want victory in all of these areas. But if you're anything like me, maybe you've realized that finding victory in these particular areas is, is hard to find. That when it comes to our wealth, I mean, have any of you here ever received a raise before? I mean, don't worry, I'm not going to ask for another offering, so you can be honest. <laughs> My guess is that most of you have, found a, have received a raise before. But what did you find with that? That after the second or third paycheck, your life had pretty much adjusted to your new income. And well, with that, you know, the raise didn't make that much difference and the victory really was in the past. It wasn't much of a thing anymore. When it comes to finding victory with your family, there's certainly seasons in which that's a thing, but there's also many seasons in which it's not, in which you're struggling with your spouse or you have a strained relationship with one of your children, or maybe you're struggling with a parent even. I, I know many people whose marriages are, are having challenges right now. I even know of a few that are thinking about separating. I know of one family who the daughter literally won't speak to her father right now, and that's been going on for years, and it's over a political argument that they had some time ago. And it's just these types of challenges that 
help you to realize that having victory with family is hard to do. Victory with your career, well, you just have to have a season in which you get a layoff, you get a furlough, or even get passed over for a promotion that you realize that having victory in your career is just tough to come by, especially whenever that, uh, at the end of your career, the twilight of your career, you got retirement on the horizon, and, and then you're beginning to move into that season, you realize that your career really isn't what life is all about, or even finding victory in your appearance. Now, there's another virus that is an epidemic today. It's what we would call the chest or drawer virus. I think some of you know what I'm talking about. It's when your chest falls into your drawers. (laughs) It's a virus that many people have to deal with today. But my point is, is that Father Time gets the best of all of us at some point in time. And finding victory with your religious obedience, you can make some progress for a day, maybe a week, maybe even a month. But at some point, at some time, you're just not going to measure up. That what you hope to do, you don't do. And you think what you shouldn't think, and you say what you shouldn't say, and then all of a sudden this religious obedience goes from being a victory to a defeat. And yet the Bible still says that we can find victory. But where do we find victory? What place is victory at? Well, the thing about victory is it's not a place. It's a person. And the Bible tells us that we can find victory in Jesus Christ. This is specifically what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But thanks be to God. And why should we thank God? Because he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And how does he give us victory? Because we still deal with these challenges in these important areas of our lives, with our family, with our fitness, with our finances. If we're dealing with challenges and obstacles, how can we have victory in Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus hasn't necessarily entered into every one of those areas of our lives and made them be without bumps in the road. Instead, we have victory in Jesus because he has conquered death. In verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 15, it says, The last enemy to be destroyed is death. In other words, the greatest enemy to be destroyed is death. And the argument here is from greater to lesser, that instead of Jesus coming into this world and dealing with all the different intricacies of our lives, he came into this world to deal with the greatest problem of all, the last enemy of all, which was death which he conquered at the grave. And when he conquered the grave, he took away the sting, the finality of death away. It says this in verse 54 and 55 of 1 Corinthians 15, death has been swallowed up in victory. Whose victory? Jesus' victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? That if Jesus is taking care of death, If he has been raised from the grave, then victory can indeed be found in him. Now, some of you very thoughtful people, you may not even consider yourself a Christian, wonder if the resurrection is really something that you can believe in. Well, I can say that one of the strongest apologetics for the Christian faith is actually found in the resurrection. Now, there are other dynamics of Christianity that are argued and debated, but easily the strongest reason to believe in Christianity is the resurrection. I'm not going to lay out all of the reasons for you to believe, but I will give you one just now. And the number one reason I would say that you can believe in the resurrection is because of the women. The women who went to the tomb to see Jesus, to prepare his body, to to be there to pray even. And when they came to the tomb, they found that the tomb was empty. And then Mary Magdalene encounters Jesus there. And she goes back, and this is what happens. That when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Now, why is that an apologetic for believing in the resurrection? The main reason is is because this was an incredibly male-centered, chauvinistic society in this day. Women were not appreciated. Women were not counted. And in a court of law, a woman's testimony was rarely given credibility. If you're going to make up a story that you want people to believe is true, you probably wouldn't use a woman to be the primary witness 
to be the primary initiator of what it is that you want people to believe. The only reason that you would allow these women to be the first to see the tomb and Mary Magdalene to be the first to encounter Jesus, the only reason that you would allow that to be a part of the story is because it was a part of the story. It's because it was true. And it's because that we can believe in it. And it's because of this that we can have victory in Jesus Christ. And so what are the implications of Jesus' victory over the grave? What are the implications of this victory that we can have in Christ? In light of what it is that I'm saying. In light of the fact that we still have challenges and struggles that we deal with in life. What are the implications of this victory? Well, the first thing is this. Is that we can trust the path that he has for us. We can trust the path that he has for us. There's this tendency of ours that when we're on God's path and we deal with obstacles, we deal with challenges, there can be a tendency of ours to second guess ourselves and to think that we are on the wrong path. But Jesus didn't promise us a life of complacency. He didn't promise us a life of comfort. Uh, uh, Even truthfully, he didn't promise us a life of having all of our wants satisfied. This is what he said to the disciples when he called them. He said, follow me and I'll make your life comfortable and I'll give you everything that you ever wanted. No, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That right now you are fishermen, but if you follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. In other words, I'm going to invite you into something that is grand, something that is grandiose, something that will change the entire world. It will take you from the path that you were on, and it will put you on a different path. You just have to trust me. Put your confidence in me. Follow me, and I will invite you into something that is beyond your comprehension. But it's still going to involve challenges and obstacles along the way. They and us just have to be willing to turn around and follow the path that he has for us. Edward Palmer, a pastor and author, is a man who graduated from Princeton Theological Seminary. While he was there studying, having lived in California and grown up there, he would often travel back around the spring break with several of his friends to California to spend a few days there. Now, traveling from Princeton to California is quite a drive. And so what the friends would do is that they would not stop other than to get gas and to use the restroom and to eat. That was the only reason that they were stop, would stop from Princeton all the way to California. So they left one evening, and as they were driving through the states, heading through Pennsylvania, just getting into Ohio, it was about midnight. Edward had been sleeping for some time. He didn't realize where they actually were. His friend had to stop and get gas. But as he was driving down the road, he didn't see a gas station on his side of the road. And so he had to go under the freeway to the other side, park the car, fill up the gas tank. And then he asked Edward if he would drive for him because he was getting tired. Now, I don't know if you know where this is going, but Edward didn't realize that they had driven under the overpass, the the freeway, and gone to the other side of the freeway. So Edward then gets back into the car, and he starts driving back through Pennsylvania, heading towards Princeton. Now, it's late. It's dark. He can't see what direction he's actually going in. But along the way, there were a few signs. There's a sign for Philadelphia. And then there was a sign that said Boston was several hundred miles away. And he thought to himself, I didn't realize Ohio had a Philadelphia or Ohio had a Boston. And he dismissed the signs and continued to drive in that same direction. Until a flicker of light began to come up over the horizon. And he realized that that was the sun. And the sun was supposed to be behind him because he thought he was heading west, but the sun was in front of him rising into the sky because he was driving east. And when he realized what he had done, he pulled off the road, woke up his friends, and told them what had happened. He got out of the car. They began to argue and blame each other for the situation that they were in as they were trying to figure out how far they had gone, how long he had been driving in the wrong direction. And all the while, Edward Palmer is thinking to himself, the risen sun is pointing us back into the right direction 
into the path that he has for us. He is shining a light towards the direction that we need to go in, and we just have to choose to go the right way. We have to turn around and go back. We have to turn around and come to our sentences, and maybe that's where some of you are at right now. Maybe you're seeing signs around you with the path that you're on that you're not supposed to be going the way that you're going, and right now, you need to turn around, and there is a risen sun, and he is shining light on your path, and he is showing you the way that you need to go, but you aren't sure if you can trust him, and what I'm trying to tell is is that because he has conquered the grave, because he has risen from the grave, that you can trust the light that he is shining on the path that he has for you. Paul says these words in verse 34 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, come back to your senses as you ought. You don't have to get revenge. You don't have to keep being angry. You don't have to keep being bitter. You don't have to keep being gritty, greedy. You don't have to be, keep being lustful. You don't have to be so scared, so anxious, and allowing all that is happening around us to consume you. You don't have to be that way anymore. Turn around and go back to the way that he has for you. Paul says, stop sinning. Because of the victory that we have in Christ, we will face challenges, we will face obstacles, but we can trust the path that he has us on. The next implication that we have of the victory that we have in Christ is that we can rejoice in the face of challenges. We can rejoice in the face of challenges. The reason that there's an empty tomb is because there was a cross. The reason that Jesus was buried is because he was crucified. That without the pain, there could not be the resurrection. And we know That even though we may face challenges here and face challenges there, that if God has conquered the grave, that even in spite of the pain that we may go through, there is a resurrection that is always possible. And he can resurrect that marriage and he can resurrect um, that, that relationship that you have and he can resurrect your finances and your career and he can resurrect your faith even. Did you know that in 1865, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated? And then in 1876, there was a plot to rob his body, to, to have his body stolen. And then it was going to be held up for as a ransom. But the government caught wind of this plot and they were able to stop the people from stealing Lincoln's body where it rested in Springfield, Illinois at the time. But after that, rumors persisted for some time that his body wasn't actually in his casket and his coffin. And so in 1901, a plan was put together to once and for all assure everyone that Lincoln's body was there and that no one would ever disturb it again. And I have here a picture of the group of people that dug up Lincoln's coffin. There were 23 of them that were there. And after they dug up his coffin, they each, they opened up, they opened it up and they looked inside and every one of them confirmed that that was indeed Abraham Lincoln that was in the coffin. His body had not decayed to the point that you couldn't recognize him. You could still recognize his features from the pictures that had been taken of him. And so his body was unanimously confirmed to still be in that grave. And you know what they all did? They celebrated They celebrated that he was there. They dug a 10-foot hole. They put him in his coffin into the hole. And then they encased his coffin with 4,000 pounds of concrete, assuring that no one would ever again tamper with his grave. And here's what I'm trying to say, is that if so many people could rejoice over Lincoln's body still being in the grave, then how much more should we rejoice that Christ's body is no longer in the grave? And so as we encounter challenges and as we deal with obstacles, we have a God who is greater than all of these things, and he will take the pain and he can resurrect out of it something that is beyond our comprehension. Because we have a God who has never met a grave 
grave that he cannot empty. He's never seen a body that he cannot raise. He has never encountered an illness that he cannot heal. He has never came across a virus that he cannot eradicate. He has never seen a marriage that he cannot reconcile. He has never seen an addiction that he cannot subdue. He's never seen a cynic that he cannot save. And he certainly never met a sinner that he can't forgive. In Psalm chapter 32, verse 11, we are reminded to rejoice in the Lord and be glad. You righteous sing, all you who are upright in heart. Not all of you who are without pain and all of you who are without struggles. It's like, no, no, no. Those of you who are leaning into the Lord, you need to rejoice. And that's why in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. Always rejoice. Why? Because Jesus Christ has conquered the grave. And the last implication of the victory that we have in Jesus is this, is that we can maintain hope in the end of the story. Because as we all know, that even though God can do many things, he doesn't always do what we want him to do. And sometimes our health doesn't get better. And sometimes there's still funerals that we have to attend. And sometimes there's still empty tissue boxes that's set beside us as we wipe away the tears. And sometimes we still have to sign divorce papers. And sometimes we still have to deal with lawsuits. And sometimes we still lose a business. Because sometimes you have to deal with some pain and some hurt, some bumps in the road. But none of those things ever change the end of the story. The end of the story that says, All of those tissue boxes go away. Those divorce papers are no more. The end of the story that says that broken relationship will forever be restored into eternity. The end of the story that says all things will be made right. And we have been promised this, that one day he is going to make all things right. That the end of the story with God is always good. It's always good. There is a Bible verse in John chapter 20, verse 7 specifically, that always caught my attention. This is the verse. The face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. So Peter and John are in the tomb. They're observing what it is that has taken place. They want to know why Jesus' body isn't there anymore. And then John makes this interesting point that this cloth had been folded up and placed by itself. Now for us, we might just think that, well, maybe Jesus has has sort of got this OCD type of thing and he always has to make his bed when he gets up. That's not, I don't think that that's what was going on here. (laughs) If you actually look into some of the Hebrew culture, into the ancient world, what you find there is that masters would often have grand meals in their homes. And they would spend hours at these tables eating. Servants would attend to them. They rarely spoke with the servants as they were attending to them. But as they were at the table for hours, there would generally be a need at some point in time for the master to get up and to leave the table. The servant, though, because they weren't sure what was going on, didn't always know if the master would return or not. But there was a sign. If the master was going to return, he would take or she would take her napkin, fold it up, and place it off to the side apart from the plate. That way the servant knew that they weren't supposed to take the plate away because the master was going to return. And if they wadded up the napkin and threw it down, then they knew that they could pick up the plate, clean everything off, clean the place away because the master wasn't returning. And what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, one day I'm going to return. I have folded up this linen cloth. You know I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to make everything right. And this is what John, the Revelation says as the Apostle John is writing here, that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, mourning, crying, pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. And so as we are living out this life, we don't have to allow anxiety to be crippling. We don't have to let fear debilitate us. Instead, we can have confidence that the end of the story is going to work out. And we have a God 
who sent his one and only son into this world to die for our sins, that if we would believe in him, we will not perish, but we will have eternal life. And how do we have that confidence of an eternal life? Because Jesus Christ conquered the grave. And so find your victory this Easter in Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the victory that we can have in Jesus. Lord, help us all to quit looking into these other things in this world that we so desperately try to find satisfaction from and completeness from. And Lord, help us to turn to you to find a victory that is all perfect, that is sufficient, that will absolutely satisfy us, that is in Jesus Christ. And so may we see that victory today. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
We sing this song, Because He Lives, together. Wherever you are, lift up a voice, lift up a shout of praise to the risen Jesus Christ. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know. Good morning, church family. If you don't know who I am, my name is Juan Fayez. I get the pleasure of serving here as our student pastor here at Valley View. And man, what a blessing it is to hear that message of hope from our pastor Phil. And I just want to remind you today as you go on with your day, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives in us today. So go with that. We love you guys. We miss you so much. Join us again next week for our 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. services on Facebook. See you guys.